And I introduce Mr. David Irving, our famous and founding father. Meine sehr verehrte Damen und Herren, ladies and gentlemen, I intend speaking to you in English this evening, as I am sure most of you understand English. Ich werde aber dazwischen immer wieder einige Wörter Deutsch uh, einflechten. I will occasionally use a few words of German to make the Germans among you also feel at home. I am, as your president this evening rightly said, an English historian, but I concentrate for my crimes almost entirely on German history, largely through an accident. A the fact that I concentrate on German history comes from the fact that I worked in Germany many years ago as a steel worker, and one of my fellow steel workers had been in Dresden during the German, the German Holocaust, if you can say, the, the British air raid on Dresden that killed 100,000 people or, or more in the space of two or three hours. And Having been introduced in this rather inelegant way to the crimes committed by others during the Second World War, I decided to sit down and write a history. <coughs> At that time I was only 21 or 22 years old, and I intended to write a newspaper article, but the newspaper article then became a book, and the book Der Untergang Dresdens, The Destruction of Dresden, was published around the world, and that is the reason why nowadays the media, the lazy writers, the journalists, the world's press, talk of Hiroshima, Auschwitz, Nagasaki, and Dresden, all in one breath. Until my book was published, nobody except the Germans had ever heard of what happened in Dresden. And now, towards the end of my writing life, I find that I'm having to re-examine one of those other towns, Auschwitz. And it's a very, very painful process, because halfway through my writing career, I wrote a book about Hitler, a biography of Hitler, in which I was still a believer. And now I've turned into an unbeliever. In fact, having given evidence in a trial here in Toronto in April this year, I was telephoned by some friends on the west coast of the United States who said, welcome to the ranks of the damned. It was as though I'd been bitten by a vampire. I was now one of the undead. And it was an uneasy feeling, and I, I thought, well, I'm sure that this gentleman thinks that he's doing me a favor calling me one of, one of the damned, but he's not because life is not going to be easy for me as a historian and as a writer now that I have gone over the, that particular brink. And I'm going to talk to you in the course of the next half hour or so about how I have come to that new conclusion. I've changed my opinion, my belief. But in the process I'm going to tell you a little bit about the way I write books and the way I select or reject evidence, because that's all part of the story. I am notorious as a writer as a writer who rejects, as a writer who refutes and repudiates. If you remember, many years ago, in 1983, I was notorious for the fact that I was the one who exposed that other six million fake, the six million dollar fake, the six million dollar Adolf Hitler diaries as being fakes. This is me at the press conference, in the middle of Der Stern's press conference, million to that kind of money at his disposal, to lard around. And yet somehow we've got to keep up this fight because we're all dedicated, we're resolved and determined to find out what really happened. And this is where people like me come in, the historian. Because Churchill himself said it is the job of the historian to find out what happened and why. And the problem over the Holocaust, if I can use that cheap phrase, the Holocaust, the problem with the Holocaust is we've been told what happened. And the historians of the last 40 years have spent an awful lot of time and energy trying to find out why. And they've accepted what they've been told about what happened. And now that a few brave men are out there re-examining the credentials of what really happened, they are coming under colossal attack because, of course, they're shaking a multi-million dollar business at its very roots. And this isn't just David Irving saying it. This is... This is this is, a phrase that was used, this is a phrase that was used by the great English Jewish authority, the chief rabbi of England, the United Kingdom, Lord Emmanuel Yakovovitz. He himself is the one who said that the Holocaust has become big business, and it's a shame. And I agree, it is a shame, because if it happened, it was a tragedy. 
And let me say right in front that a lot of things happened in World War II were tragedies. I mentioned Dresden, but I'm also going to say what the Germans did frequently to minority groups or the people in whose people who temporarily fell into their clutches. That was a tragedy. None of you could do anything for it because you weren't the ones who were committing these crimes. But it was a tragedy nonetheless. But we have to find out what the true scale of that tragedy was. And also, it's not without interest to find out if the tragedy was a tragedy which the entire German people wanted, if it was a tragedy that the German state inflicted on these people, or the Fuhrer acting on behalf of the German state and in the name of the German state, or if it was a tragedy inflicted by a group of 100 or 100, uh, 500 or 1,000 nameless criminals, the kind of criminal that you find in every demimonde, in every military organization and structure. You only have to look at what the United States did in Vietnam, what Lieutenant Calais did to, to My Lai, to realize that there are criminals like that, regrettably, in every army, in every unit, in every corps. Not just the Germans, not just the Czechs or Ukrainians. You find those criminals everywhere. I, I've been working the last two or three weeks in the American archives. I'm over here in North America for four months now. I shall be over here working in virtually every major American archives. I drove up specially from Syracuse yesterday to come and speak to you here in Toronto today. I'm speaking, I believe, in Ottawa tomorrow to a similar audience, and I'm going on down to Harvard and Boston to work in the archives down there. Because I make a habit of using in my books only primary sources. Now, by primary sources, I mean the actual documents written by the actual men. Hugh Trevor Roper, Lord Dacre, as now is, the great English historian, who unfortunately was had the misfortune to say originally that the Hitler diaries were genuine, but then he rapidly changed his mind. Hugh Trevor Roper told me, Mr. Irving, when you look at any document, ask yourself three questions before you accept it in your research files. Firstly, is it an authentic document? A simple question, but it's an important question. Secondly, why does this document exist? For what purpose was it written? And thirdly, was the person who wrote this document in a position to know what he's writing about? There's such simple criteria, and yet how often you can reject a document out of hand as being useless for the purpose of writing history because it doesn't meet one or, or the other of these three criteria. Obviously a document's got to be genuine. And yet when we come up against the Auschwitz case, just to simplify our whole issue this evening, on the name Auschwitz, that one great big kingpin of the whole Holocaust mythology. When we come up against that, we find documents that don't even meet that simplest of criteria, the authenticity criterion. And then you come up against the other criteria. Who wrote it? And why does this document exist? And then you begin to suspect perhaps this document exists for a reason completely unassociated with establishing the truth. It was written in 1944. The war was still on. For what purpose was the document written? Was it written for a specific psychological warfare purpose? And when you self start asking yourself with a pure and clean mind these simple questions, then you realize that you're coming up with awful answers, with answers that are so awful that they give you nightmares, because you know that your career as a writer is probably over from this moment. After attending this trial in Toronto in April, giving the evidence that I did give there, I went back to London and I talked with my publisher, Smith Millens, one of our oldest and most widely respected publishers in the United Kingdom, who published my last three or four books, and God bless them, are going to be publishing my memoirs. And I, believe me, into my memoirs, I'm going to be putting all the stuff that I can't put into the books. <laughs> now, Millens, I've mentioned... I've mentioned to Macmillan's that I intend to write a book about Auschwitz, and I can say I have never seen jaws sag before. <laughs> These jaws sagged, and the blood drained from their face. I, I mean, every cliché was there in the editors that I spoke to. They are not at all happy that I'm intending to write a book about Auschwitz. I've reassured them that it's not for several years yet, and it's probably the last book that I shall write. <laughs> Inevitably, because this is a book that will please very, very few people indeed, and it's going to take a book, a, a, lot of, a lot of research. And the research is what I'm doing at this moment. I'm going around the United States archives, working ostensibly on other subjects, but I'm at the same time digging up what they have on this one case, and doing the kind of work that historians should have done over the last 40 years. And the reason I'm doing it is because of one man. And I must admit that when I first got to know the name of Ellen Zundel, I was apprehensive. 
And when I was met by somebody in Vancouver a couple of years ago at the airport and I was introduced to him as being a friend of Alan Zundel, I thought, my God, I'm being photographed with a friend of Alan Zundel. This is the beginning of the end. The, rake, the rake's progress. Let me skip forward to April this year when I saw the kind of documents that had been collected for the Zundel case. And I say that Zundel has done two pieces of research. He's done two pieces of research that I am ashamed that I never thought of doing myself. The chemical research and the forensic the investigation of the site. Actually out in Poland. If there's, one, if there's one thing that has converted me to the ranks of the damned, it is what I saw here in Toronto in April. And it has given me an open mind. It's made me go back to redo the research that I should have done all these years and re-look at the files. So that now, as in Syracuse, the last couple of days where I've been working in the files of the American Attorney General, his private papers, Judge Francis Biddle, one of the judges at Nuremberg, you find his private diaries, and you find all the documents and materials related to the to conduct of the, those infamous trials at Nuremberg, and you find out that when he himself, sitting on that lofty bench in Nuremberg, heard the witnesses giving their evidence, ostensibly coming from Auschwitz, and ostensibly coming from Maidenek and the other horror camps. And this American judge who's been through it all before, he sat on countless benches in his career. He writes down in his private diaries, I've got the quotations here with me if you're interested. He writes down after listening to one French woman who claimed to have been in Auschwitz and claimed to have experienced all these unimaginable tortures and atrocities. He writes in brackets in his private diaries, I don't believe a word of this. I don't believe a word of this. This woman describes how, well, you know the story that they told. The, un, uh, the, the bestial atrocities that were conducted on them. The smoking chimneys, the crematoria, the bodies, the unloadings, the standing naked in the cold. And then, incidentally, one or two little bits and pieces that give the sense of very similitude, which stick in your memory because she says we were made to take off all our clothes so they could be disinfected in the special chambers. Ah! But of course, Judge Biddle at that time, he doesn't associate that with what was then subsequently found and, the, and the, the receipts of the documents for the Cyclone B and so on. But he's a suspicious man and he continues writing as she's describing how the women are sterilized and the men were castrated often. I would have thought that being castrated once was enough. But these are the words in her, in her testimony. And so it goes on. The evidence is there in the files. And over the week before, I've been working in Hyde Park, not Hyde Park, London, but Hyde Park, New York, where the Roosevelt archives are. Now, the uninitiated historian might imagine from the Roosevelt archives, you're just going to find President Roosevelt's papers. But no, you'll find there the papers of a lot of bodies and agencies that were connected with the Roosevelt administration. Very strange people have donated their papers to the Roosevelt archives. And I never realized until I turned up at the Roosevelt Archives 10 days ago to work there for, for a week or more, that they have in those archives the entire papers of the War Refugee Board. Now you might think that that's a very unpromising kind of body. But the War Refugee Board turns out to have been three men. Henry Stimson, Cordell Hull, and Henry Morgenthau Jr. Henry Stimson, Secretary of War, Cordell Hull, Secretary of State, Foreign Minister, and Henry Morgenthau Jr., that rather murky, ominous, insidious figure, the head, the head of the American Treasury, the Secretary of the Treasury. So that was the War Refugee Board. And they were responsible for channeling colossal sums of money from various Jewish bodies like the, uh, the Joint, uh, Joint Distribution Agency, the World Jewish Congress, and various other bodies with which we are all familiar, into Europe in 1944, making sure that it reached the Jewish organizations in Europe and helped the Jews out of their tragedy. And we're not going to deny that the Jews were in a tragic situation in Europe in 1944, not just in Germany, nobody wanted them. This was the situation they found themselves in and the American Jews rallied round and provided colossal sums of money and in the records of the World Refugee Board, the War Refugee Board, are the checks and the receipts. The receipted photocopies, the receipted checks for millions of dollars from the World Jewish Congress being sent over to Switzerland where the Americans had their representatives. And then, in July 1944, come the first signs of an extraordinary document coming out of Czechoslovakia. A report allegedly by two Slovak Jews who have been in Auschwitz. And this is one of the kingpin documents of the whole Auschwitz case. 
if not the Kingpin document. It's a long report, about 25 or 30 pages long. It's in the uh, Roosevelt Library. Two young Slovak Jews who claim to have been in Auschwitz and claim to have witnessed all these atrocities. And the extraordinary thing is there that this is the seminal document of the whole of the Auschwitz mythology. You find everything in this document. The gas chambers, the crematoria, the smoking chimneys, the addressing, the undressing, the women, the, the, the men, the babies, the children having their arms and legs torn off. All these extraordinary lurid details as though written by a journalist are in this Slovak report. And of course I'm interested because I want to see the original and it's not there. The only documents in the files are an English version of the report and a German version of the report, but no Slovak version of the report. And this is allegedly written by two Slovak Jews who have escaped from Auschwitz. Okay, well, I'm not going to let you into too many details of the research that I've done in the War Refugee Board. I just want to give you a few hints of what is coming in a few years' time when the book comes out. It is very likely, in my view, that this report was written by two men who had been nowhere closer to, to, to Auschwitz and probably Madison Avenue. Who knows? I don't think it ever existed in a Slovak version. The authenticating documents associated with it are uh, originated by the American legation in Bern. The American uh, ambassador in Bern sends report after report to the State Department describing how he's trying to authenticate but not getting very far and he keeps on coming up with second and third order evidence. He says, I've spoken to the papal nuncio who claims to have interviewed the two men and he finds them very credible. And then gradually it comes out that the report has been concocted with the assistance the editorial assistance of the Jewish resistance organization in Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia. So it isn't a report by these two men at all, it's a committee report written by some nameless committee in German. And when it came out in November 1944, finally, after it was smuggled out of Slovakia in dramatic ways to Switzerland and then brought out of Switzerland by the Americans, sent to Washington and then uh, issued by the War Refugee Board on November the 26th, 1944, remarkable things happened. The first remarkable thing that happens is that the Washington Post and the New York Times declined to print it. Every other newspaper in the United States printed it except these two magnificent, respectable, responsible newspapers. The Washington Post and the New York Times said we want further and better particulars before we're going to fall for this one. Very interesting. And two of their best journalists actually challenge it. One of them fi finally writes in a column in the newspaper, uh, we've had so many atrocity stories in this war, we want to have a few more details about this report put out by the War Refugee Board. And it's so refreshing to go back to a wartime document, November 1944, and find people, even then, challenging something about that. Because, of course, now it is heresy. You can't challenge it. We can do it here in this confidential room because no one's going to go outside and start telling what I've been saying. But we can't do it, because if we do it, we are in some way beyond repair. We are, we are, we are we're bandits. We're illegals. In Germany, we are illegals, of course, because in Germany, uh, as this eine Lüge, die uh, uh, gesetzlich verankert wurde, it's, uh, the lie has become anchored in law in Germany. In Germany, you are not allowed to challenge the six million or Auschwitz, because if you do, you are breaking the criminal, tri criminal law in Germany. And in this country, and in America, and indeed in Britain, it has become something akin to blasphemy. It has become a religion. It has become a religion as holy as the Holy Scriptures. And anybody who stands up and says, I don't believe, in a voice of, of anything less than the utmost reverence, then he is blaspheming. And it is very difficult, of course, for a historian now to stand up and start challenging the Holy Scriptures with the methods of a historian. He's not allowed to. And soon the position will arise where we are not allowed to stand up and start criticizing this particular piece of holy mythology because an entire industry has grown up around it with all sorts of holy priests, Eli Wiesel, for example, that unfortunate gentleman who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize last year. <laughs> Regrettable case. It, it can't be very nice to be called Weasel, but you don't get awarded pr peace prizes for that. <laughs> I mean, at most you should be entitled to some Humane Society award, but not a peace prize. <laughs> so, so this is the first thing we find, that when that report was issued on November the 26th, 1944, responsible journalists who knew their job 
challenged it straight away. They had a gut feeling that something wasn't quite right. The second thing we notice about it is that one of the people who was ostensibly a member of the War Refugee Board, Henry Stimson, he knew nothing about the report being issued over his name. The first he knew about it was when his Assistant Secretary of War, John McCloy, telephoned him and said, Henry, what the hell is going on? And Henry telephoned the other Henry, Henry Morgenthau, who'd actually issued the report. Morgenthau had the War Refugee Board housed in his building. And we've got the Henry, the Henry Morgenthau diary, and let me just read out what Henry Morgenthau's diary says on that day. November the 27th, 1944, the Henry Morgenthau diary, on the morning of the report being splashed in the newspapers. Stimson phoned him. Morgenthau says, how are you? Stimson says, I've just learned that there was some quite striking announcement put out as to the atrocities yesterday by the Committee on Refugees, meaning the War Refugee Board. Well, it must have been done without anybody showing it to me, so I was rather mortified by not knowing anything about it. <laughs> yeah, mortifying, isn't it, to find out that your pal Morgenthau down the road has issued a report over your name? This sensational report about the Germans killing 1.75 million people in one camp by gas with all these bestial atrocities, and you find your name has been appended as one of the signatories. <laughs> Morgenthau says, well, I. He's interrupted by Stimson, who's obviously very angry. You see, Morgenthau kept a verbatim record of all his telephone conversations, which in this case is rather foolish. <laughs> Stimson says, I don't think Taylor ought to do that. Morgenthau says, well, I was under the impression, I know he showed it to me. Stimson says, I know, I'm thoroughly, I'll probably be in thorough sympathy with any such announcement, but I think it's important to get it out. But as long as I'm one of the committee, I think I ought to know about it. Particularly when you and I are the only two members of the committee in the sickness of Howell. Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. It turns out that the third member of the committee, Cordell Hull, was off sick. Uh -huh. So now we understand how the report gets delayed from July 1944 until November. He waits till Cordell Hull is off sick, the Secretary of State, and then he issues it without the telling the other member, Henry Stimson. So we're learning a little bit about how this magnificent report on Auschwitz came into being. And then yesterday, as I was going through the private papers of Justice Biddle in Syracuse, the judge at Nuremberg, a little thought lit up in my head. And it's the kind of thought that lights up in my head, but not in the head of the average historian, because it's a thought you're only entitled to light up when you've done the work. Something is missing. You're missing something. And what we're missing on this occasion, of course, is as follows. At Nuremberg, a year after this Auschwitz report hit the headlines, at Nuremberg they produced a French woman and a Dutch woman and a Polish man and a Czech person, any number of different people who had been in Auschwitz to give evidence these ridiculous scenes about children screaming, Mummy, how am I going to walk with only one leg? This nasty man has torn off my leg. These extraordinary things that are actually in the testimony at Nuremberg. And yet, the Slovak document was not introduced as evidence. Nor were the two Slovak Jews produced as witnesses either. Although they had the most extraordinary report, giving chapter and verse and dates and details and statistics. Of course, one of these two so-called Slovak Jews, a man called Verba, is now peregrinating around the world, attending various conferences and claiming to have been one of those particular two signatories. So where was he at the time of the Nuremberg trials? The whole thing stinks. And to my mind, it is proof that the Nuremberg authorities, the prosecuting authorities, if they ever considered tabling that one cardinal document, which has now become one of the cardinal pieces of evidence, looked at it, shook their heads, possibly even investigated it, and found out that its source was something completely different. And there are two possible sources. One of the possible sources was, of course, our own Secret Service. And I'll come to that in a minute, the British Secret Service. And the other possible source was the German Secret Service. And this is an interesting thought. Did the German propaganda op operation in 1944 decide to feed to the Allies evidence about Auschwitz? Atrocious evidence about Auschwitz. And you may think, well, if so, of course, there was a, it was a big own goal. But this isn't just me saying this. Was, this was the suggestion put forward to the War Refugee Board by one very learned correspondent a few days after the publication. He wrote a letter to Stimson and to Henry Morgenthau saying, isn't it possible that we've fallen for Nazi propaganda? Because if you read the report from one side to the other, from the beginning to the end, the one fact that sticks in your craw at the end of it all is the fact that the people who were doing the killing and the organizing and the listing and the documenting were Jews themselves. This is what the Nazis want us to, to swallow. 
the fact that the really cruel people in World War II, the ones who were absolutely ruthless even towards their own people, were Jews. And if you think, of course, that they're scoring their own goal by putting out atrocity stories about Auschwitz, the Nazi propaganda ministry will have said, they will have said, who cares? We're being blamed with these atrocities anyway, so let's put that in as the meat, and deep in the meat is the barb that we bury, saying that the real people are doing the killing with the Jews. A vicious piece of anti-Semitic propaganda put out by the Nazi propaganda ministry. I'm only offering this to you as one possible origin of the Slovak Jews alleged report. Not my own theory, it's a theory which is in the files of the War Refugee Board. And the other theory is the interesting one, which again I thank one of Mr. Zundel's henchmen, who's been doing extensive work, Paul Norris here, who's been doing extensive work in the British archives. By doing the work in the British archives that the other historians have not done, Paul Norris has turned up the evidence that our own psychological warfare executive were behind the entire gas chamber story. Back in the 19, early 1940s, 1942, 43, 1944, our psychological warfare executive, the PWE, which was a branch of the British Intelligence Service, decided in a prolongation of the entirely admirable and justifiable propaganda warfare that we had conducted so well in World War I, you remember the stories about the Belgian children with their hands hacked off by the wicked Germans, which everyone believed for years after World War I. We carried on with the same methods in World War II, with big lies and little lies, and the biggest lie that we propagated, as far as I can see, was the gas chamber lie. And once again, we're quoting from the archives. They're in the British archives, how the psychological warfare executive decides quite cold-bloodedly and cynically to start putting out over the radio waves the allegation that the Germans have built special gas chambers for gassing the Jews and getting rid of them. And later on in the files, round about 1944, you find the chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee who is responsible for the psychological warfare executive, writing a handwritten mi minute. His name is Victor Cavendish Bentinck, an eminent banker, an industrialist, still alive in England now, Lord Portland as he is now, chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee, writing and handwriting in 1944, words to the following effect. We've had a good run for our money with this gas chamber lie, but really we've got to be a bit careful because eventually it's going to be exposed and then our entire psychological warfare effort will be brought down with it. So isn't it a bit, isn't it a good time now to distance our, ourselves from this particular story? We've set the hair running, and now we ought to let it go off by itself. A good run for their money in 1944, and here we are in 1988, and that hair is still running 44 years later. And nobody has bothered to link the, myth, the mythology of 1988 with the documents in the British archives in 1942, 1943, and 1944. I'm only offering this to you because, of course, people are going to say, well, if it wasn't true and if it didn't happen, then how do you explain that everybody knew about it? My own publisher in Germany, Albrecht Knaus, a lovely man, he published my Göring biography, which unfortunately is all gone. I only brought ten with me for you from England. Albrecht Knaus, he's, he's, I think he's Jewish himself. I've never asked him. But I know he, he, suffers, he suffers with each book of mine that he publishes. And he said, Herr Irving... You've done it again in your Goering biography. We're going to have to do something about this Entlösung problem, the final solution. Mm -hmm. And he says, everybody knew about it. I knew about it. And I, have, I say to so him, Herr Knaus, with the utmost respect, and I'm not calling you a liar, you didn't know about it. You have persuaded yourself that you did. It's a kind of van idee, a massen van. It's a kind of mass hysteria that after a time, people believe they were there. I've discovered it as a historian. I go and interview people, and they become very indignant when I had to point out to them they weren't there. They weren't in the center of the stage giving the orders. They were miles away. And they read about it years later. And after a time, they really believed themselves to have been there. And it's, it's, it's not an ugly human trait. It's, a, it's human nature. You believe you were there because you recall it so vividly. And the Jews are an impressionable people. And it is part of the Jewish tragedy that they believe they were there. And they're rather ashamed that they weren't there. They're happy that people do believe they were there. I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not saying this in any way as a put-down on the Jewish people, because it is a tragedy, it is part of the nightmare that they are still living. They want to have been there, and they feel slightly guilty that they somehow survived when all the time this six million killing was going on, which they've now heard about, you see. And that's why they get indignant with the likes of me who come along and say, well, let us get to the bottom of this. 
And when Knaus, my German publisher, says her Irving, ich bin doch schließlich viel älter. I'm much older than you. He's 75. He just turned 75 now. And I have to say here, Dr. Knaus, I work in the archives. I don't work in memories. And the archives tell an unmistakable language. We know exactly what people knew at that time because the Gestapo kept what are called morale reports, Stimmungsberichter. And these are complete and intact in the archives in Koblenz. And we know exactly what happened because people wrote letters and diaries. And they wrote letters to each other which were intercepted by the British Secret Service. Millions of letters were intercepted by the British.